Welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa, where we talk about financial empowerment while exploring financial assistance available through local, state, and federal governments each month with a diverse group of subject matter experts. Chicago, are you ready to get financially empowered? Well, we've got just what you need. Without further ado, give it up for your Chicago City Treasurer, Melissa Conyers Irvin. Good afternoon and welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. It is Women's History Month and today we'll be discussing a topic that I've been passionate about um, for about at least the last two years. And that is the role of women as leaders during this pandemic. The last two years have taken truly a toll on all of us. But I think it's fair to say that when crisis strike, it's often women who are in the position to hold us all together. And this pandemic has been no exception to that. I know we'd like to think that traditional gender roles are a thing of the past, but the unfortunate reality is that it's still mothers who carry a disproportionate burden of household and child rearing responsibilities. And that load increased exponentially when entire families were suddenly confined to the home for months on end. It was typically mothers who had to manage their children's day-to-day -day education when schools went remote. And many were working full-time jobs at the same time. Wow, who's as you think back on it, it's it's still really unbelievable all that we have been through. And I think that I can speak for all working mothers when I say that helping your child stick to remote learning is really its own full-time job. I do know that personally. And so, of course, another difficult scenario is one in which women and mothers have unfortunately lost their jobs or had to leave the workforce as so many really did during this pandemic. And that brought a whole new set of challenges. And so all of us experienced, I would say all of us, experienced greater isolation during this pandemic. And the extended family members who before might have watched the kids after school or just helped out on a Saturday night so mom could take a break, they really couldn't come over because everyone had to stay in their own homes. So it really wasn't as safe then, right, for grandma to come over before the vaccine came, um, but you really had to be on the front line as a mother. And certainly I would be remiss if I did not mention our teachers and nurses who are as well disproportionately women and they have carried an enormous burden over the last two years. And one of the women whom I am so proud to have with us on this afternoon, one of the women who has been at the forefront since the beginning of this pandemic is our distinguished guest on this afternoon. And I'm so thrilled to really even hear what all she has to say, what she has seen throughout this pandemic. Um, but I'm just really, excited to have her because I think even as a woman, and we're in Women's History Month, so I thought this was the right time to bring Dr. Allison Arwady, the Commission of, Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. This is certainly um, a woman that is a household name in the city of Chicago, and we certainly want to um, really thank her for everything that she has done for all of us. I mean, this lady has been looking out for all of us. So what an appropriate um, guest on this afternoon. So I'll say welcome, doctor. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, for the work you do and, you know, to all women and men too, but you're right that women often their accomplishments sometimes don't always get noticed as much as the men's do. And, um, yes. you know, appreciate you highlighting some of that. And I like that you said, and the men too, I like that. Yeah. Um, and you know what? That's what we as women do. We're so inclusive and we say in men too, but it is Women's History Month. So we're going to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really delighted to have you here with us today. So I'm just going to jump in. 
Um, and I really want to start by asking you if you even remember, oh my gosh, it probably seems like so long ago, if you remember that first moment back before, you know, the toilet paper started disappearing from the shelves, before the devastation really hit, when you realized that this was going to be the kind of catastrophic once in a lifetime, I would say, pandemic that most of us had only read about in history books. Yeah, it does feel like a long time ago. I had been confirmed as the commissioner at Chicago at, for the Chicago Department of Public Health by city council actually in January of 2020. And just four days later, the health department activated for COVID. At that point, that was around starting to screen travelers from O'Hare. Certainly, we were already paying a lot of attention, and we had our first case uh, here in Chicago by the end of January. At that point, we knew this was a big deal, but we were still thinking of it more like Ebola, potentially, where it's a big deal, but it's something that you can control using you know, typical public health approaches. And in fact, those early cases, we were able to do all of the, the control that we expected. I think a couple things. For me, what made me the most worried was watching what happened, especially in Europe and in Italy early on. Uh, we don't think of Italy as being a country that doesn't have medical resources. And we were seeing hospitals already start to fill up with patients. And that tells you that this is serious, this is a big deal. Um, and the combination of, of seeing right there, kind of in early March, the potential of even sophisticated health systems getting overwhelmed, seeing that shortly thereafter starting to hit in New York City. And then compared on the science side, for me, this, this wouldn't have been the sort of thing the public would have seen, but I remember reading an article really early on where it was suggested that people could spread COVID before they had symptoms, before they knew it. And I was like, oh, like, please let that not be true. Because if that is true, like all bets are off, right? And so really at the beginning, it was like, no, I'm sure that's not true. And then as it became more known that that was possible, that for me was when you you can't use the Ebola approach. You can't use the traditional public health approach. And we knew at that point really that this was, this was gonna be a major problem. I don't even think I realized that you had been appointed as commissioner all within the same month as when the pandemic hit? Yeah, we, we, um, it was, I had been the acting commissioner for about six months before. Wow. And I, I was the chief medical officer at CDPH for a good five years before that. But yeah, I was formally confirmed by city council in January. And literally four days later was when we, was when we activated, when we, we started screening folks at O'Hare airport coming from China. And it's been COVID, COVID, COVID ever since the most, the rest of the world didn't start paying attention for, you know, another couple of months after that. But we were, heavily involved, um, you know, right, right from January. And so we talk about trial by fire, but <laughs> um, the great part is that, you know, you were built for this. And we'll yeah. talk a little bit about your experience and you just hit on it a little bit. Um, you're certainly not new to this, um, but let me, let me ask you, you know, we saw a lot of women in positions of leadership really guiding us day to day throughout this pandemic. You were up there alongside Mayor Lightfoot. We saw Dr. Ezekiel. She was there with Governor Pritzker each and every day. We even saw Dr. Emily Landon from the University of Chicago. She was out there um, in full effect. And we saw so much powerful leadership from women from day one who just really connected with residents in a very human way. I really think that you and even Dr. Ezekiel was there at a time such as this, because this pandemic took such a toll on our families that to see women in these leadership roles, the people that are connecting with us, it really does make a difference. And so obviously we know men still outnumber women in positions of civic leadership, but we're certainly seeing more women in medical school now. We're seeing... Um, more women in, in all of these different areas. However, male physicians still outnumber female physicians. 
So when you look back, what effect do you think that it had that so many women, at least here in Chicago and even Illinois, were leading during this pandemic? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting and important question. And I would even broaden it a little bit to say that, you know, I worked in academic medicine for years before moving more full time over to public health. And that is a setting where most leaders are men still very much. And um, one of the things I love about public health is it's a space that has a lot of women leaders in it. And I think part of that is because, let me tell you, I certainly never had a goal of being a name that is known in Chicago, right? <laughs> I, I, am, I, am, I love my work. I love public health. But people who are interested in public health, almost by definition, are interested in teams, are interested in sort of how do we work collectively. It is not a field for people who want to sort of be the name and, and be the, the kind of um, leader who perhaps doesn't want to take as much input from others. And so I think there's a reason that women um, often, more often, are in leadership roles in public health. And so, you know, it, there's all, obviously there's, there's amazing men in public health, there's amazing men in, in leadership positions. But I do think women perhaps overall are more likely or more comfortable saying when we don't know things or having a little more humility when uh, things don't turn out as expected. And I do think certainly around things like infectious diseases, you will lose trust very quickly if you try to pretend you always know everything all the time. And so not that it's always women, but I think there's a little more forgiveness, frankly, in society for women um, perhaps being a little bit less strongly assertive all the time. Um, and certainly for a pandemic, to build that trust, you need to be able to say, yes, I have expertise. Yes, this is my recommendation. But there is a lot we're still learning. And you need to recognize that I will yes. tell you as much as we know. And I think some of that are just expectations, different expectations that we set for women. But I think leaders in general, good leaders, should be able to do that well. And, and I think in my experience, sometimes women are more able to do that um, than men are. I'll tell you, it, 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 and I, I mentioned this a moment ago, I cannot stress how it made a difference seeing you and that role seeing Dr. ZK because, and, and by the way, we've also had a conversation with her as well. <laughs> um, but for us to be able as a woman, right? And I mentioned about the stress of us, you know, in the household and, and all of the things that we had to do and to be able to see another woman who can really relate to us, mm -hmm. that makes a difference. And certainly with the pandemic, it was so many things that we, we were all learning and we just didn't know. And it, it seemed for me to hear it from a trusted source made a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And I like that you said, you may not have known everything. There were some things that everyone was trying to figure out and it was very human mm -hmm. to see that you all were the same way. You were very human throughout this process. And that makes a difference. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is what I've told my team. My team knows very well that as long as they are making the best decisions that they can at that moment with all of the information available, with their expertise, you've got to be willing to make that call. And certainly, I knew an awful lot more about outbreaks and pandemics, certainly, than the average Chicagoan. And I had a lot of confidence in my knowledge. But there are always, you, there's always things you look back and say, you know, if we had known that you could spread COVID without having symptoms at the beginning, right? That would have been probably something different about masks from the beginning. It's not that you didn't have that knowledge, but you've got to set up that like, you know, you should trust the information that I'm sharing with you because I'm sharing it from a point of knowledge and belief in your well-being. But that also um, there are things that will continue to surprise us. And COVID has continued to surprise us, you know, uh, every few months. Now, on that note about COVID has continued to surprise us, mm -hmm. what has been the hardest thing about having to lead during a pandemic, especially in such a visible way? Yeah, so... You know, there's a few things. I think, um, you know, first of all, luckily, I love this work. I love this, my team. This is, this is what I've been trained to do to, you know, trained to do. There's nothing I would rather be doing. Um, 
when I think about there's sort of two main areas. One uh, is just the same thing that everybody else was experiencing, that this complete disruption of, of daily life. Um, the fact that I couldn't go and do the things I love to do in Chicago, that I had to worry about, you know, all of that regular, that sort of isolation that was coming along with it, uh, the disruptions to the things that I love to do, right? I'm experiencing that just right along with Chicagoans. And that just as it has for everybody else has made this hard. I think paired with me, prepared for me there um, is that at a moment when most people could sort of retreat a little bit, like I've got to be one of the few people in Chicago that had to upgrade my wardrobe like during, <laughs> during shutdown, right? Um, because I couldn't work from home and I suddenly was having this much more public need to, you know, be out a lot. And, and um, I had to kind of pair this difficult personal time like it was for everybody with needing to be sort of much more personally out there. And then that's getting paired with the fact that people do start to recognize who I am. And so there's not, I, I kind of lose my anonymity and I have to be sort of, not that I wasn't being careful, but I have to be extra careful and aware when I'm out and about knowing that people are paying a lot of attention to what I'm doing and where I'm going and may have opinions about that. Um, and then I think more, and then and then later, you know, I, I love the way Chicago by and large stood up around COVID. We saw people all over the city just do amazing work, right? Mm -hmm. Say, what can I do for my neighbor? Like, mm -hmm. I am part of public health. Let me change the way I do things. Like, we really did well with that. I think by and large here in Chicago, we've done a good job with some of the things like the masking. I know they're not fun, but they help protect mm -hmm. and they have absolutely helped keep keep things down. But as things have gotten more political, um, particularly nationally, that's just been hard to see because of course, my goal is one is pretty basic. It's like, let's get through COVID, let's have as few people get seriously ill and die. And seeing how strong the sort of misinformation and disinformation campaigns were, you always know that you're gonna be combat combating that, that's just mm -hmm. a, a part of the job. But to see it get tied so closely to politics was not as clearly something that I was expecting. And so this, this idea of, you know, perhaps not wanting to wear a mask or not wanting to get vaccinated, becoming as much about my identity or my sort of political beliefs as my beliefs in the world or in health or in medicine um, was, was, was challenging. And I've had a lot of, uh, you know, people make a lot of assumptions. They think I make money when people get vaccinated. They think I, you know, somehow am benefiting. And I'm like, no, I don't even get paid overtime, you know, like, right. and, 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 and it's been hard to see that, that loss of trust in sort of public health and government, um, even though I think most people continue to have it. And it's meant that I've had to think carefully about sort of some of the messaging a little bit. And I've, you know, as you know, I've, you know, like, I love that you do this. Like I've been doing Facebook lives, taking questions directly from the public yes. seven days a week at the beginning, but even now twice a week. And we get a lot of people asking very aggressive questions on there, but I think it's good because then I can say, let me actually explain the data behind this question. Let mm -hmm. me help you understand the context. But it's been, you know, it's been long, like it has for everybody. Um, and it's, it's been it's been hard to see some of the basic things that help keep us healthy as a society really being attacked. Now you just said something that was that um, I want to piggyback on when you said it's been long for everyone. I think sometimes we need to take a step back and really just digest what you just said. Mm -hmm. It has been long for yeah. everyone. Yeah. So like when you say we're tired of wearing masks, yeah. who the heck want to wear masks? Right. Hey, I would like for you to see my smile and, you know, right. I got a new color lipstick, right? Right, right. You, you know, that's not really cool when I have right. a mask on, you can't see that. Right. But no one, I mean, no one wants to do that. No, of course not. And it's for the safety, right? right. And right. so I, I think you said a mouthful when you said it's been long for all of us. We all wish we could just snap our fingers and this pandemic is over. Yeah. Me, me at the front of that line. <laughs> yes. Literally. Yes. Right. Um, but you made a point. Uh, I just think that's so important. And so for everyone that is listening, I mean, we're all, yeah. we, we all wish that it would be over and, and you're working so hard so that we can have herd immunity, that, that makes a difference, right? Um, but let me ask you, I was, I was thinking about when you was talking about the politics of it, because 
that's so strange. We're talking about public health mm -hmm. and public health was somehow so strangely turned into politics, you know, so you're a part of a mayoral administration. Um, so you obviously know about politics, but your job is public health, not politics. So when this public health crisis, because that's what it is, it's a public health crisis, is suddenly turned into a political football. Like, how did that affect you and your role as a leader? You, you spoke a little bit about this, but I want you to go a little bit further because it's a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a couple things on this. One is I would say I do not at all take for granted that I am still in my job two years later. Many of my counterparts across the city have, I mean, not across the city, across the country, um, have lost their jobs, have been forced out of their jobs, have had to resign because they were done with the death threats, you name it. And I think that I do not at all take for granted that here in Chicago uh, and generally here in Illinois too, the political leaders, whether it's Mayor Lightfoot, Governor Pritzker, have really not just leaned on, but sort of let the public health, uh, the science, the expertise uh, lead in the decision making, right? Like obviously big decisions we are making together, right? Like with the mayor, with her team, but it's been a very collaborative and, and, and personally supportive relationship. Many, many politicians around this country, we saw only want to own the, the good parts. They want to stand up when it's time to take the mask off, when it's time to reopen and do this. And I will tell you here in Chicago and, and broadly in Illinois, the, the politicians have owned the hard parts with the public health leaders too. So that when we are having to do the things nobody wants to do, like you know put limits or, or require masks, it hasn't been the politician saying that's the public health leader's fault, right? And blaming it on them. And I do think that some of the success generally that we've had, you know, certainly, but you know, Chicago has done way better than other cities our size. Illinois has done way better than other states. Some of it, I think, is that um, because if you lose that trust or you start really questioning the the what we do know about keeping people safe, which is not rocket science usually, but it does take. Some, it sometimes takes some hard decisions, um, and you let the politics drive it, and you draw, and you and you have that that wedge in place. I don't blame the public for just kind of giving up, you know. Um, and so, I really have learned how important it is to make sure that I am being sort of a forceful voice for what is needed from a public health perspective. That I don't just. Uh, you know, say, oh, you know, it's your decision. Like it, 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 it's, it's my decision in, in collaboration, of course, always with the other, other things that are, that are in place. Um, but, but we didn't see that happen in a lot of the country. And even if you look federally, there was a lot of finger pointing at public health leaders um, and looking to blame and, you know, who are we actually, I mean, the blame is, should be on the virus and it should be on what are we doing collectively. And it's been so, you know, people are like, I still, I get all of these super political messages like, well, president, you know, more people died under President Biden. I'm like, do I care? I don't oh, care. Really? I'm like, good job, President Trump for getting the vaccine done. Yay. Wonderful. Love it. Right. Like, good job, President Biden. Like, I don't care at all. I do not care. I am not an elected official. I will never be an elected official. I have no interest. Obviously, my work has to fit into, into that context because I do work for the government. But like, I've known all along that like, I will make my recommendations and um, I won't sort of compromise what, what should be done based on my and my team's knowledge and data. I won't compromise that recommendation um, for political reasons. And I think you start to do that, your people are just done with you, so. Dr. Arwady, that's amazing that this was so enlightening um, as, as I listened to you speak, and I know the audience listening to you, to just hear how a public health crisis, how it turned into a political football. So just kudos for you to just stay focused, right? That's what you do, you stay focused. And I know we really appreciate that. It's, and you all have made some tough decisions. Yeah, very tough. 
Very I well. mean, tough. And yeah. as you said, well beyond you and Mayor Leifer, Dr. EZK and Governor Pritzker, tough positions. Yeah. And you've done that. And certainly um, you've gotten us to where we are today. And you spoke a little bit about your background, but I want people to know really how much experience you have. Um, and a lot of people may not know that, that you really have first, just really, well, this isn't your first up close experience with infectious disease. And, and you've worked in the Middle East during a MERS outbreak. People may not know that. You worked to combat tuberculosis and HIV in Botswana. Mm -hmm. And you were there in Western Africa during the Ebola outbreak of 2014. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So talk about how those incidents prepared you to lead in this role. And a lot of people may not even know this. I mean, you come with a lot of experience for us. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I actually went to public health school even before I went to medical school. Um, I have a master's mm. of public health and I've had a very, very, you know, forever outbreaks and infectious diseases have been my interest, right? Going all the way back to college, really. and the whole time that I was in medical training and, you know, spending, being full-time taking care of patients. And, you know, I still, I still see patients just in general primary care, but the, my main interest always was in the infectious disease side of things, did a lot mm. of international work, um, took a year off from medical training to work for the CDC for the first time. Um, did you work for the CDC? I worked for the CDC. Yeah. So like that Botswana work that was, that was with CDC. Uh, and then I, and then I worked a second, time for the CDC, I did something called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Uh, yeah, which is which is a two year like postdoctoral kind of training program that is two years of outbreaks on the ground outbreaks. And I responded, you know, with training, learning how to do this. I'm already a doctor at that point and a public health professional, but it was like, learn how to do outbreaks in schools and prisons and hospitals and outpatient settings and internationally. And you know, so if there is one thing that I have been well trained to do, it's it's to think about outbreaks and 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 at some level, the same tools and approaches that you use for like a small little foodborne outbreak or you know people getting their ears pierced and you see infection spread, those approaches are actually not dissimilar from like these much larger you know national or, or even international pandemics and you know i'd done a lot of exercises and planning i certainly the year before actually just right the year before covid broke cdph had spent a year updating our pandemic plans we had done it around yeah. influenza yeah but we we had a we, we, there was an entire exercise that we actually imagined an influenza that, that came from China to Chicago. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, we actually had sat down that last year and said, you know, who's got the authorities for what? Um, what if we had to close schools and feed all the kids? We brought in folks from across the city all kinds of partners and actually did some exercises. What if the hospitals need PPE? You know, have the system for having that in place. Exercise this, exercise that. And so, it, this this is not, you know, I do, I am really proud of CDPH because I think we were in, it turns out, a much better position than a lot of other health departments. And frankly, in some ways, even the, the, the feds were, I think, um, in terms of having plans, having things in place, having stockpiled personal protective equipment ready to go for the hospitals. Turned out that was not in place like it should have been across the country. And not that you're always going to do everything, but like this is the thing that I care about. And see, you know, things like being able to do Middle East respiratory syndrome outbreaks um, or Ebola, that was with CDC also. Uh, you are seeing firsthand, especially I, I, I deployed a couple different times for, for Ebola. And that first time, especially it was early. It was just as things were really getting bad there and shutting down. And at that point, you know, I'm not in a leadership role, but I'm part of the team that is like advising and helping the Liberian Ministry of Health as they are dealing with all of the politics and, and seeing the healthcare sh system shut down. Like during the time that I was there, they didn't have the personal protective equipment they need. They didn't have all these things. And like literally the hospital shut. Like you couldn't go to the hospital to have a baby. You couldn't go to the hospital after a car accident. Like, and seeing what happens to society when you lose the healthcare system was something that 
was really visceral for me. And so for me, like protecting that healthcare system, protecting the healthcare providers is always sort of just in, not even in a theoretical way, in a personal way, like at the front of what I'm always thinking about when we're thinking about, you know, outbreaks and pandemics. Oh my gosh. Pregnant, ready to have a baby. Yeah. And can't go to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, across the whole the whole country. I mean, this was a real crisis, and there were there were like no resources. That's the other thing. Liberia is one of the poorest countries uh, in the world, and they didn't. I mean, I'm in these settings where like there's one pair of gloves, and people are trying to like put the same pair of gloves on, and this is a disease that is spread like you got cuts on your hands and you touch, it can spread, and it's got like a fifty percent mortality. And so, not surprisingly, the healthcare workers were like, you know, and we were seeing, you know, I was at a hospital while I was there, like three quarters of the staff ended up getting infected and a lot of them died. And like, you, yeah, the whole thing shut down. Like you couldn't get meds. You couldn't go to the hot, like couldn't do it. And that is just, you know, not that we were going to get to that point, but early on here, the thing that was so strange for me was this feeling of here I am sitting in the wealthiest country in the world in a city with amazing healthcare resources, like amazing. And I'm sitting here like on the phone yelling about needing more ventilators, even when we had had ventilators like in stock more than a lot of places have. This idea that you could overwhelm, because I had always overlaid this thing of really seeing things fall apart with having no resources available to see things falling apart in a setting where there are resources was, I was having a lot of flashbacks actually to sort of that time in Liberia. And, and it was one of the most, it was one of the strangest things for me kind of at the beginning of this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, this, this interest for me is, is longstanding and um, I kind of know worst case scenarios in my mind. And my goal is to obviously keep keep us all here away from that kind of worst case scenario. I, I feel, um, I mean, you, you just don't know when I listen to you speak, I'm like, oh my gosh, we are just so blessed in Chicago to even have you well. um, looking at all the experience that you have. And I keep saying at a time such as this, you were meant to be here. Um, you could have been anywhere, Dr. Awadi, but um, certainly I would say Mayor Lifer chose the right woman for the job. Oh, well, um, thanks. And I'm so happy about that. Just listen to your experience. I'm like, wow, you've seen a lot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm one of the few people who, when this started, I was like, okay, like, this is what I know how to do, you know, like, and, uh, there comes with a lot of, a lot of responsibility does come with that. But it was like, you know, right at the beginning, I was like, well, I know we're going to stop shaking hands. That's one thing that I saw in Liberia, right? Like it's some of these wow. things that like are not just coming from a textbook. They're coming from like, how do you help people sort of feel safer, decrease risk, even as you're learning about a virus, even as, as everybody can't get the testing yet and you're still sort of working out the details. There are basic things that people can do um, that will decrease risk, even as you learn about it. So wow. yeah, I mean, I remember early on, like those are some of the kinds of recommendations we were giving. That's awesome. Okay. Well, good information. I'm going <laughs> to switch a little bit because we've learned a lot about you. This is Women's History Month. We have some awesome women here in Chicago that rock. Um, so let me kind of switch a little bit and talk about other ways in which women have been leading during this pandemic, including as mothers of children who are going through a hard time, as teachers with all of the challenges that entails in this day and age, and certainly as frontline healthcare workers, right, who have been at the end of their rope, oh my gosh, yep. for more than a year and feeling like people just, maybe sometimes they feel like people just aren't coming together to follow public health guidance. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a lot of women drop out of the workforce, which is something that is so near and dear to me because I understand, I know how challenging it is and how much was on our plate at the time. But um, certainly a lot of healthcare workers deciding that the struggle just wasn't worth it. Um, what did you hear from women who were struggling in various ways during this time? And how do you think that it has affected us as leaders in general? Yeah. So 
I am always very interested, not just in the direct effects of COVID, but the indirect effects of COVID or of any outbreak. Yes. And we have seen this hit women harder in so many ways. We saw so many women dropping out of the workforce or pulling back because of these childcare needs, as you say. Like there's real worries about um, losing a lot of the gains that women, you know, had been making in terms of getting closer to parity around salaries, in terms of, uh, you know, recognizing abilities, et cetera, that this is not something that, that will be recovered from, I think, quickly. Um, I also think that, that women do tend to be in those caregiver roles more often, right? Whether that's nurses, whether that's teachers, you know, you think of the stereotypical roles that women are in, and those tend to be hands-on kind of roles. Those tend mm. to be um, roles where it's harder to keep distance. Those tend to be mm. roles where you're often needing to put the needs of others a little bit before yourself. Mm. And so I think continuing to do a lot of those kinds of roles, you know, those that essential work, um, more of that can fall on women at the same time that they are, you know, needing often historically to pick up a little more of the 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 child and kind of at home responsibilities. And so, you know, when I think about the indirect impacts, it's I'm I'm interested in sort of how they fall disparately. And and I do think unfortunately, especially in the workplace world, mm -hmm. um, it's gonna take a while to get back to even as far as women had gotten on parity in in the workplace and in leadership positions and in all of this. I think, you know, I love, you know, one other thing in, in Chicago uh, government, you know, I love how many women are in leadership roles, even in like, you know, you're the treasurer, the mm -hmm. head of the office mm -hmm. of budget management, the head mm -hmm. of the procurement, the head of, you know, the financial leaders for the city of Chicago are also all women. And that is an area where women are very rarely in those leadership roles. And so, you know, I like to think that that having women in unexpected leadership roles can help set some of the um, policies and sort of thinking about the, the whole family health and the flexibility, health, you know, some of that that allows women to sort of be more successful in a long-term kind of way. I can tell you at CDPH, you know, even long before COVID, we were really, we've been pushing hard for things like, making sure everybody has sick leave available, right? Making sure people have family and medical leave. And who gets the most impacted when we don't choose those things as a society, it does tend to be the women. And I'm hopeful yeah. that as a sort of post COVID that we'll see some positive changes and things like, you know, there's a lot less tolerance, I would hope for people going to work sick, right? And that recognizing that when you set up policies that sometimes get thought of as policies more for women, they are actually good for everybody. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and thinking about the financial implications of those goes beyond sort of what is this minute, but kind of in that, in that larger country. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think we're going to be sociologists, obviously, just like we did for the big, huge pandemics a hundred years ago, et cetera, we'll be really looking at all the impacts, but I don't think the news overall will be good for women. Yeah, we got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do because we want to make certain that we keep women in these roles because as I said, how you have certainly helped us throughout this pandemic, we want to see women in these roles. So this is this is a perfect example of how we help each other and yeah. how we as women, we come together because we wanna see each other successful and we know the importance of having women in these roles. So- um, I, Yeah, I also think one thing I really liked out of COVID was this new focus on what is an essential worker right? Uh, this idea that there are a lot of people who may make lower wages, but are absolutely essential to the work that we do as a society. Um, and that those people demand, you know, appropriate protections and rights and yes. pay. And, and many women, as you know, are in 
um, can be in some of those jobs that I think historically are sometimes a little more overlooked or not thought mm -hmm. about so much in policy. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, there are some going to be some good things, I hope, sort of coming out of this in a long term kind of way. And I think I think, you know, the recognition of of inequities, the recognition, you know, sort of this didn't fall equally on, on men and women. This didn't fall equally on races and ethnicities. Mm -hmm. There are different opportunities um, that have really, you know, it, it's in people's faces when you see deaths and hospitalizations sort of showing up differently. It's the same disease. There's nothing biologically different, but it's about decisions we've sort of made as society. We've made about who gets health care and how and what that needs to look like. Um, and so I'm hopeful that some of the lessons we learned from COVID will be in that sort of policy and particularly some of the some of the parts that have not always been as kind to women as they have to mm -hmm. men. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we're talking about I think I thought of the word hope, right? Yeah. Um, and I really like to hear from you about your hopes for the future. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that our city and our country really is in a need of healing in so many ways, not just physical, right? This after this pandemic. Um, but I'd like to hear from you about your hopes for how healing will come and really what that may even look like. Yeah. So, the first hope I have before I talk about healing is that as a society, we recognize that public health, preventive medicine, the sort of behind the scenes stuff that keeps us safe every day is something that needs to be supported, funded, and sustained, um, not just when there's a pandemic. You know, we had seen at CDPH, like we had uh, public health departments across the country, Every year, year after year, cuts, 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 you know, where we've got a quarter, you know, at the beginning of COVID, I had 25% of people that we had had a, a few decades ago. And we've gotten a lot of funding and support with COVID, but it's come in this sort of, here is a grant for two or three years or, you know, and we've hired a lot of folks who are doing amazing work out in the community, exactly the sort of things we want to do. But at the moment, all of that funding is is very much tied to COVID. And my worry is that we will go right back to where we were and not be in a place to be prepared for a pandemic, but forget prepared for a pandemic, working on the chronic disease issues, working on the things that underlie our life expectancy gap, et cetera. So one hope is that, you know, I no longer have to explain to people what public health is, what an epidemiologist is, like why it's needed. So there, I have hope that, that, that we will sort of as a society recognize um, the need to not just sort of throw money at something when it's a crisis, but to make sure we sustain some of the, some of the basic things that keep our food and water and, you know, mm -hmm. environment safe all the time. I think in terms of healing, it's a big, important question. Um, as you know, CDPH does a lot around mental health and we've been putting um, you know, Mayor Lightfoot has directed a lot of additional funding and resources, and we've really been building up uh, the ability to make sure that Chicagoans can get access to mental health supports, regardless of income, insurance, immigration status, et cetera. But it goes beyond just being able to get treatment. I think for me, when I look back on these next two, last two years, of course, there's been a lot of hard stuff, but like, seeing the way this city stepped up for each other, right? Unheard of. Thanks. Seeing housing agencies, working with food support agencies, working with clinics, working with cr criminal justice, you know, anybody, you know, in the, in the social service side, they we will sometimes see a lot of siloed, et cetera, et cetera, saying, nope, we're all working on this together. Let's get it done. I think in government, you know, seeing... We saw folks from across the city of Chicago, like, come and help out with the Vaccine Operations Center. You know, this thing of like, how do we break down silos? How do we work on big problems together? We've tried to take some of that same approach from COVID, you know, into thinking about how do we coordinate better around violence prevention, right? Like, how do we bring some of the really positive lessons of COVID? Um, how do we give community voice and decision-making and funding? Like, that has got, those are some of the things that have gone really well that we want to sustain. And I really, um, I have a lot of hope that 
we, we can actually have some pride in what we have done here in Chicago. Yes, it's been terrible. Yes, it's been hard. Yes, it's not over either. Although, you know, hopefully we'll be in a good place, at least here short term, I know, and, and ideally long term. Um, but we've not seen quite the level of ridiculousness that we've seen in some other parts of, of the country. And more to the point, there are so many just regular Chicagoans every day who are out helping neighbors, you know? And if you can cultivate that as a city, if you can build that, whether it's block clubs, whether it's church groups, whether it's, you know, neighborhood, like whatever it is, you know, I think a lot of the strength of Chicago is sort of the neighborhoods and the connections and the family. And we have that more here, I think, in some ways than some other cities do. And it's it, it proved itself to be a real strength mm -hmm. in COVID. And I think it's what, when I look ahead, yeah, there's a bunch of policy stuff that we should do and there's a bunch of funding things. Mm -hmm. But I think for Chicago specifically, coming together around common enemies that are not each other, but are like, you know, some of these larger issues. Um, we've got a lot of, we have a lot of practice from that in these last couple of years and some templates for how to do that work, for, for how government can sort of work with nonprofits, can work with for-profits, can work with individual folks um, to to really, to, to move ahead with that. So a lot of collaboration. A lot of collaboration. Like I never saw the level that I've seen here. Um, and, you know, I remember probably a year through COVID, some, you know, I was on a call and someone was like, well, I'm part of public health too. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, someone who would never, I was like, you are right. Like, it's great. Like, I love that. So it's all collaboration. So we have some hope. We yeah. have something to look forward to in the yeah. future. And we're in a much, we're in a much stronger place true, also because of investments that have been made, you know, CDPH couldn't have done testing for variants two years ago. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the funding right now. We do it every day. No problem. And so, yes. right. Like there's been a lot of investment. There needs to be more, but like we are, we were already strong and we have gotten stronger um, as a result of, of these last couple of years. So I'll tell you, I have one more question okay. for you before we go, but before I get to that question, um, I just, I, I just want you to know, I, I've just listened to you, um, throughout this past hour and I'm just like amazed, right? Um, obviously we know you do your, you do a podcast for the residents to be able to ask you direct questions. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're so approachable. Um, obviously we've seen you on television throughout this entire pandemic. And it's interesting, as you said, as a um, commissioner for the Department of Public Health, you never thought that your, um, your position would be so visible. No, right? We this usually should... fly very under the radar. Right. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Dr. Arwady? Oh yeah, we, we know right. Dr. Arwady, right? <laughs> right? And so uh, certainly the, your your whole life has changed. That's a, yeah. your whole life has changed yeah. uh, being the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. But I personally, as a resident of Chicago, thank you for what you have done. I thank you for your service. Um, and I was just thinking as I was listening to you, because we as women, like I'm listening to you, you're smiling, you're talking. Um, certainly, I know you're smiling because the numbers are going down, right? <laughs> um, but the number one predictor of my mood. No, I'm just kidding. Yes, right? You know, you're like, I'm, you know, I'm looking at you, but we carry so much on our shoulders and we do it so well, Dr. Awadi. And I want women that's looking at this to see you. You're carrying a lot. I mean, really, I mean, we're relying on you, right? Oh my gosh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> and I just love how human you are and you are just, you are just doing it. So just keep doing it. Oh, and thanks. And, it's all, I have a great team. I mean, this would not be doable Absolutely. without like an amazing team here. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And that's what we do. We make certain we have a good team around us, right? <laughs> that's very important because at the end of the day, one person can't do it alone. It's yeah. impossible. So I ask you one last question before we leave today, because it is Women's History Month. And certainly we'd like to shine a light on amazing women like you, but I wonder who would you like to shine a light on? Who are the women who inspire you and give you hope? So, I mean, always you have to mention 
your mother, your grandmother, yes. right? The, the, the people who really made you who you are. Um, and I've, I've been really lucky to have strong women, uh, in my life personally. Strong women I, make strong women. They Come do. On. They do. They do. Um, but I also, it is Women's History Month. And yeah. way back when I was in public health school, um, I did an entire project. I wrote a big, like, research paper, um, about a woman named Sarah Josephine Baker. Not the Josephine Baker who people might be thinking of. Yes. Um, but from about a hundred years ago, who was a very early woman leader in public health in the New York City Department of Health. Um, and if people have heard of Typhoid Mary, perhaps, mm -hmm. she was the person working at the health department who actually had to handle Typhoid Mary's case. Um, but she also got a lot of attention for educating Americans about the fact that infants in the U.S. were more likely to die than soldiers in World War I. Um, really a lot of early sort of leadership at a time it was very difficult to be a leader she was named um she wasn't like the commissioner but she was she was put in charge of the maternal child um health bureau at, in new york city uh in the first couple century uh, the first couple decades of the 1900s and all the men quit because they refused to work for a woman like that was yeah. the level of of you know what she was up against and just did amazing work um, for the New York City Department of Public Health on the ground in neighborhoods like really ahead of her time and she was somebody who you know when I was looking for people that never get recognized but I think did amazing things mm -hmm when at a time when it was especially hard for women to do amazing things, uh, Sarah Josephine Baker, look her up, um, and uh, saved a lot of lives in New York and broke a lot of, uh, you know, kind of barriers for women along the way. Wow. So we could certainly talk all day. Sarah Josephine Baker. Yep. See, we have a homework assignment. You do. Kara. Go ahead and Google her. <laughs> well, as we uh, get ready for prepare, I think we've covered a lot, but in case there was anything, is there anything that you want to say before we close out today? You no. can just use this moment to say whatever you want to. Yeah, I, I would just say, so first, you know, thank you for, for having me for the work that you and your office do um, and, and for having these kinds of, of, of opportunities to actually talk a, a little bit deeper uh, uh, beyond the headlines. And I think it is important to talk about um, the, the role of women I also would just like to say uh, just a big thank you to Chicago. You know, you've heard me having a little bit of a love letter for this city all along through here, but I really um, have, have been so thankful for the way that many people in Chicago have done sometimes the harder thing, but kind of the, the, right, or the right thing for, for public health, people who have supported me individually um, and my team. And uh, just, you know, I know how hard it's been. I know how long it's been. Uh, we're, we're hopefully, uh, we're definitely coming out of the woods. Hopefully we're staying out of the woods. Yes. Um, but I hope that people will, even just looking over these next kind of few weeks to months, I think it's going to be a hard time as, as, as we're lifting some of the requirements, but people are going to have strong opinions and still a lot of worry. And we just ask Chicagoans to, uh, you know, continue to be kind to each other, recognize that enemies here is just the virus. And everybody's got the same goal of, of getting through this and getting done and moving on. Um, and, um, you know, that's part of what has been some of the best parts of, of COVID in Chicago. And I want to remember that, you know, as, as the strong point that it has broadly been. The enemy is the virus. The enemy is the virus. Yeah. Not each other. Not each other. Yep. So my sincerest thanks, Dr. Allison Arwady, the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thank you for your time today. And really, again, leading us during this pandemic. Happy to talk to you during Women's History Month. Um, certainly, this was a great conversation. And if you're listening to it, be certain that you share the link with other women, especially, but please also share with other men. We want them to know that women rock. We want to remind <laughs> them that women rock. And certainly for all of you that are listening, continue, <clears throat> continue to follow us at chicagocitytreasurer.com. And then also looking forward to seeing you next month for another Money Mondays with Melissa. 
Until then, be happy, be safe, and certainly see everyone soon. Thank you again, Dr. Awadi, and really great work that you and your team are doing. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to Money Mondays with Melissa. We hope you enjoyed today's session and found value in the topic of discussion. Follow Chicago City Treasurer on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn to stay on top of all upcoming events. Remember, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the Chicago Treasurer's Office at 312-744-3356 or visit www.chicagocitytreasurer.com. We'll see you next time for Money.